All right, I'd like to uh, introduce Ed Glazier. He is that other school in town down the street. He's head of the economics department at Harvard. And Ed wrote one of the most uh, influential books on cities for a general audience, the, the Triumph of the City. So he's an old friend, welcome. Thank you, Ken. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I will say it's been a tremendous honor to be part of the Norman Foster team that's been thinking about, about rebuilding Kharkiv. This represents uh, my take on a joint project. There's a, there's a paper that exists together with Ian Golden of Oxford, and we're thinking about the economic infrastructure that connects with, that gives sinews to the physical plan that Norman uh, is envisioning. Um, at our heart of, of our plan is a recognition that the real city is actually made up of flesh and blood, not concrete and steel, and that cities rise or fall based on their human capital. I, I'm just showing you two figures that give you a sense of that. One shows you the relationship between share of the population with a college degree and earnings across American metropolitan areas. This is not just the fact that your skills make you more productive, make you wealthier. It's the fact that the skills of the people around you make you more productive. It's what economists call human capital externalities. The fact that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings go also go up by 10%, holding your years of schooling constant. Skills are vital for the rebuilding of Kharkiv. The other graph shows you the relationship between math skills and uh, earnings across countries. Now, the rise of Zoom does not in any sense mean an end to face-to-face -face contact, right? Anyone who is in any part of the sort of university world knows that the ability to get back and meet once again was crucial to rebooting everything that our universities do. But it does mean that talent is more mobile than ever. And it does mean that cities need to work harder to retain and attract that talent. We're pushing for five interconnected strategies, all of which weave around the, the physical master plan. First, and most importantly, and you heard Kent talk about it, and, uh, is to think about a, the universities that have so long been crucial to the strength of Kharkiv, and then thinking what you can build that wraps around that. And this is very much not a, you know, a university cluster in a traditional sense which goes to bed at night, but just as you heard Kent say, it's a, it's a research community. It's a community of people who are connected together. The physical city as a talent magnet, Empowering entrepreneurship with one-stop permitting and regulatory reform. A Kharkiv that is green, both in terms of how people live there, but also in terms of what it creates. Kharkiv is at the center of an incredible agricultural region. There's no reason it cannot be an engine of environmental innovations that make agriculture in Ukraine greener. And finally, strengthening the institutions that will encourage external investors to trust Kharkiv. So, a couple of simple points. One of which is, we're here at MIT, which is particularly appropriate, right? This is one of the two great clusters of technological innovation in the greater Boston region. The other one is, of course, along Route 28, which is also really MIT's fault, too, because that cluster owes its, its life to Vannevar Bush and Raytheon and the move out uh, away from, from Cambridge 100 years ago. But these two great clusters are the ones that actually have driven innovation in Boston for the past 50 or 60 years and driven the reinvention of this once dying industrial city into a capital of the information age. There is no reason why the universities of Kharkiv, which are a rich intellectual ecosystem, cannot serve exactly the same purpose. Secondly, if we think about the, the arc over the past 75 years, increasingly talent has been drawn to places where they want to live not just to places where they happen to be productive in the short run. You know, in, in the uh, 18th century, Dr. Samuel Johnson famously opined that when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. He was not talking about London's wages. He was talking about the joys of living in London, which are there now as they were before. We have seen those joys become ever more important, sometimes for the good, attracting people throughout the world to London, sometimes for the bad. And you can see this in, this is median house price to, to median income ratio across England. And in some parts of the north of England, that number is three. In much of the area around London, that number is comfortably over 10, right? Those high prices relative to England reflect the fact that people actually want to be there, even if they aren't earning enough to pay for the housing. Now, throughout the world, you know, aspects of living in a consumer city, aspects of living in a place that delivers pleasure, that delivers joy, right, show up again and again. We think of a city like Bangalore, magnet of talent, 
full of incredible Indian entrepreneurs, incredible Indian software uh, engineers, and yet it's a city that you know, is disconnected, in which campuses occur separately, like this is the Mind Tree campus, in and of itself an enormously pleasant place on its own, but one that is fundamentally severed off from much of the rest of urban life. That can't be the right vision for Kharkiv. Instead, mobility has to play a crucial role in this, and I just want to sort of give two traditional economist pegs for this, one of which is you always want institutions that wrap around the infrastructure, partially to manage that infrastructure, but also to make sure that you know, people don't overuse the roads. Singapore has had congestion pricing for almost 50 years. Right? It's the second densest country on the planet, and its roads move smoothly because you charge drivers for the social cost of their action. Right? You need things like that to make sure that drivers don't take over the world. Buses, there's much to love about the flexibility of buses. This is um, the Transmillennial in, in uh, Bogota. Right? You know, there's an old joke that 50 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. Right? In a world of electric buses, that's even easier to believe in. But part of the beauty of buses are they're flexible. And so you know, using buses to, to wrap around existing metro systems, of course, the metro system in Kharkiv has been not just a source of mobility, it's been a source of literal protection from, from attack. It's been vital. Human capital is not just about the stuff we learn in schools, it's the stuff that we learn on the city streets. It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote that in dense clusters, clusters the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Right? I know of no mystery that is more important than the talent and imagination to become an entrepreneur. Fifty years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a reflection of New York's industrial DNA, which lie in the garment industry, an industry with very few barriers to entry, with no returns to scale, with anyone with, with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. And so it was a mother of entrepreneurship, and those entrepreneurs went on to form, found, form movie studios. They went on to build skyscrapers. They went on to form investment banks, right? Because entrepreneurial human capital is fungible. By contrast, Pittsburgh had U.S. Steel, U.S. Steel trained company men, and they were great at logistics in the short run and terrible at figuring out how to reinvent Pittsburgh when things went wrong. Right? It is amazing how bad our measures of entrepreneurship are, and yet we still do a remarkable well at predicting urban success and urban resilience. This is just average establishment size. Do you have a lot of big firms and do you have a lot of small firms? The metropolitan areas with the biggest firms, those are five, had tiny employment growth over the last 30 years. The ones with lots of little firms had big employment growth. Right? Small firms, not, the, not big giants, are the future, right? because they have entrepreneurial human capital. Luckily. Kharkiv is full of entrepreneurial human capital. There's a rich technological ecosystem of ground-up people, and that needs to be nourished and, and en enabled. There are smart institutional things that can be done on this, making sure that permitting doesn't get in the way, making sure that you have a government that's there to help rather than to harm. Um, greening Kharkiv, right? And I just have two images here. One, of course, is bikes, right? These are actually Kendall Square bikes, right? And you know, Kent has thought a great deal about sort of greening transportation within the city. Um, but also thinking about how to connect in to the EU's research funding programs that actually involve funding innovation in things like electric tractors, which is what this is an image of, or far more massive innovations that involve the greening of agriculture and the greening of industry. Remember, you know, many of the tanks that, that beat the Germans on the Eastern Front in, in World War II were manufactured in Kharkiv. Um, this is a, a map of mine from research I did 10 years ago. This looks at carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of Boston. Right? The key point is the places that look brown, meaning central city, meaning here, are in fact green, and the places that look green are brown. And the reason for this is just the, the much shorter travel distances that are involved with people who live in dense, compact areas, and the much smaller living areas. Right, than just, you know, especially when you're in a place with a difficult climate, as Kharkiv has, right, more compact living spaces mean much less energy is needed to either cool or heat the house when you have difficult seasons. <laughs> Finally, these are uh, Ukraine's ratings on the World Bank's in in doing business indicators pre-2020. Um, these are not terrible. Right? Dealing with construction permits, in fact, Ukraine is very good. Uh, it's 20th in the world in this. Some of these things, like resolving insolvency, you, uh, Ukraine is pretty bad. All of these areas are ones in which improvements need to be made, right? Because we need to make sure that people are ready to, to rebuild, ready to move again. And, and one thing I think that we push on the report that's worth thinking about is, can the EU do something like offer insurance against future conflict for external investors as being something that's particularly valuable to think of? Last, I just want to end on these images. Norman took you to London in 1942. I want to take you back there, maybe a, a couple of years after that. In those years, this image of St. Paul's amidst the rubble, 
was a symbol of hope, architectural beauty, maybe even a little faith, amidst the inhumanity of World War II. For me, the universities of Kharkiv, standing similarly among the rubble, are similar symbols of reason, of knowledge, and of hope in, amidst the inhumanity today. Thank you very much.